just to give you a heads up why I have, I hope you can see my PowerPoint, why I have this as my first slide, you'll be like, wait, we're at the wrong talk. <laughs> but um, this is actually just a, a kind of, um, I guess a segue into what I'm gonna be talking about uh, more broadly. Um, this quote, Endeavor to Persevere, is from uh, one of my favorite films, um, which stars Clint Eastwood, um, the outlaw Josie Wales. It's uh, quite an old film, and um, I think it's really there, slightly whimsically, um, to sort of point to this idea of endeavoring to make your work good to think with. And by that I mean uh, to think in conversation with others, um, which is something that goes on quite a lot in this movie, and I, and I highly recommend it if you haven't had a chance to see it. Um, so it's kind of running behind uh, the presentation proper, um, and I hope that it, you know this talk can be a chance for us to sort of think uh, think well or think good together. Um, so I'll elaborate on that shortly. Um, this talk is, is about my recent book that came out at the end of uh, 2014, um, which is on, and I apologize for the clunky title, um, Lots of Seas. Uh, the publishers told me that I needed that uh, title so that people could find me electronically um, and, and the subjects that I work on. Um, so Cinema, Cross-Cultural Collaboration and Criticism, uh, filming on an uneven field um, is basically what I'm going to do is talk about the last chapter of this book um, and in, in effect it's going to be a very kind of cliff notes version of the entire book. Um, I look at a number of films in this in this book um, just very briefly. The first chapter is about uh, uh, East Simmer, which is an indigenous Canadian uh, production group in Far North Canada, um, and they have a trilogy of films. Some of you may be aware of them. One um, is quite well known in Atanajua, uh, or The Fast Runner, um, and then the journals of Knud Rasmussen, and the film I talk about, which is uh, before tomorrow. So that's the first chapter. The second is about Australian Aboriginal uh, documentary on the stolen generations, uh, which was made by actually a Pākehā filmmaker who, who has lived in, in Australia since he was a teenager, Alec Morgan, in conjunction with Andrew Bostock, um, who is Aboriginal. And so I talk about their collaboration. And then the final subject chapter is about um, films from Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and specifically um, examples of collaboration that have been more some more successful than others. So I look at the tattooist, number two, apron strings, and also whale rider. Um, but uh, today, um, this, this talk is largely going to centre on the last chapter, which is collaborative criticism. And in that, I tried to come to a set of sort of I guess, principles or thoughts about how it is possible for first world critics to think about and approach uh, the filmmaking of indigenous uh, nations and, and groups. Um, how might that collaboration, collaboration be envisioned? And also how audience, specific interest to me is how audiences can continue to interact with the films and the people involved with those films in a way that can assist Indigenous recovery and sovereignty. Um, now, what I've found in doing this talk before, um, sometimes people react uh, somewhat perhaps defensively to my ideas. Um, are majority critics and academics because um, a lot of what I put out uh, for consideration here is less perhaps accepted or lauded or well known in the especially in the academic world. Um, so some majority critics and academics struggle with these suggestions. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Mary Catherine Bateson. She is the daughter of Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead. And uh, her work, she talks about how this kind of work requires a new kind of learning for people habituated to seeing and understanding the world in certain ways, myself included. She says the ways we are able to perceive, and I put that in quotes. Um, she argues that the ability to perceive other different world models is one quality that a person 
comfortable with transversing cultures really has to develop. Um, so that my argument is that surely it's a skill required for those of us who write and talk and think about in this films as I do. Um, so I've got 10 ideas here and I'll try to move through them fairly um, quickly so that we can have a conversation um, about them. Um, they're definitely not the only ones and they're not the only important ones, um, but they were a start for me to conceptualize this idea of collaborative criticism. So I hope you're seeing these as I go along. This first slide, being in relationship, um, is the first step in collaborative criticism. It by definition has to, has to be. Uh, so my first slide, relationship, um, for me it's the first step in any form of collaborative criticism. Um, it, it basically, any form, I mean, if some kind of relationship is a prerequisite to any kind of collaboration, even if the relationship is not straightforward or uncomplicated. Um, it's, respond, it's learning to respond to multiple patterns of meaning um, so that we can see others' traditions as enriching rather than displacing our own. And I mentioned that um, Mary Catherine Bateson, whose who's, uh, book I'm sort of quoting from here, terms this as not having, having not only colour vision but culture vision. Um, so it takes a couple of abilities. The first is being able to recognise the innate difference of the work that's under consideration. And the second, this is not to be afraid of that, um, to be willing to engage with that work in spite of, and indeed I would suggest because of that difference. Um, oftentimes, especially in traditional academic and media criticism, this carries connotations of remove and of a challenge. You try to find what is wrong with the work. Um, whereas collaborative criticism begins and continues as a discussion rather than as a So the idea is that it's dialogic rather than divisive. And for me, you can't do this in a commitment that comes from yourself, um, from us, and I speak here for myself, um, because it asks us to accept a relationship vis-a-vis -vis the work and its makers, which right I just threw out every manual on traditional criticism that exists, basically. Um, a relationship that's often downplayed and disparaged in traditional criticism. Bateson points to expansion, not normally a word um, associated with criticism, rather than categorization or reduction, and asks us to spend less time detailing the ways that the film or the artwork failed to meet our expectations. Um, rather to move our critique beyond our particular viewpoint to, and I quote, see the multiple worlds of others. So collaborative criticism requires the self-reflexivity to recognize that our natural or customary viewpoint is only one way of understanding the world. Further, I'd suggest um, that any, this is the starting point in any kind of relationship, um, not simply those developed through collaborative criticism. So Lise Marubio is a Native American uh, scholar of um, indigenous film and I met her at a conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and she talked about how critics and audiences need to remember that the scholarship on indigenous film does not exist without the filmmaker's agency and vision. If we didn't have these films, we wouldn't be in job. Um, we wouldn't have, film. there wouldn't be anything to critique. Um, Truly collaborative criticism acknowledges the centrality of the filmmaker and their vision. But indigenous-centered work is usually not simply the result of an individual's efforts. It's a work of wider relationships, um, including creative co-workers. And these can, can include um, elders, co-directors, producers, screenwriters, and maybe other tribal members who assist in cast and crew positions. Recognizing, I want to be clear here, that recognizing indigenous filmmakers as the heart of any collaborative criticism is not a slide towards auteur theory or the director of being in charge of everything. But instead, it's an audience artist city that allows for continual exchange. So there is crucially recognition of the primacy of the filmmaker's contribution, not just or even principally to a mainstream audience, but first and foremost to their own communities. So when, when dealing 
indigenous works that are opaque or confusing, especially to Western sensibilities. Mainstream critics often assume that the fault lies with the film or the filmmaker. And I think here of Merit Amita's work, how this is a perfect example of someone who people did not receive her films well, uh, mainstream critics, because they often struggled with understanding the position that she was taking and the methods that she was using to tell her stories. On the other hand, when dealing with similarly challenging, like I'm just throwing out some examples here, Indian, French, Latin American, Korean films, critics usually assume that any lack of understanding is on their side. In that latter case, they either withhold judgment or they educate themselves around the film's themes. Employment of what I call such cultural grading, this kind of sliding spectrum of cultural worthiness, highlights the extent to which critics work to understand only certain or difficult mores, but reject others out of hand. I believe that we fail Indigenous work insofar as we limit our investigations to the screen alone. And as a media and film scholar, that's a tough one to put out there because um, textual analysis is largely our tool of trade. Um, but I feel that gathering information about tribal practices and relationships and obligations makes, can make for a more nuanced review. Um, a lot of readers especially um, and reviewers, especially if they work in industry situations, really uh, protest at this point because they say that they don't have time to do that. There's too many deadlines. They don't, they're, they're working on too tight of deadlines. But I suggest that even the tightest deadline doesn't preclude researching a lot of information that's readily available now on the web, um, put up by nations and groups themselves. Um, most Indigenous groups now have a wealth of information available online, as do the majority of Indigenous film productions. That said, the smallest ones can still be quite hard to find um, material about. But that said, collaborative criticism asks us at a minimum to at least attempt the search, at least to begin that kind of research so that we can hold a critical, in both senses of the word, conversation with the filmmaker and their communities through our reviews. Collaborative criticism also requires that we accept the reclaiming of indigenous stories as historic truths before we even begin. So, like I mentioned, Alec Morgan and Jerry Bostock recognised this with their collaborative work on Lousy Little Sixpence, which was named because of the stolen generations being told they would be paid for their labour, never in fact seeing that money um, at when they were work, working as indentured or, or forced, um, forced labour, domestic servants and so forth. Um, when uh, Bostock and Morgan interviewed Aboriginal elders, they realised that in order to get mainstream white New Zealanders to believe the stories, they would have to go into the archives and find footage as well to accompany those um, talking heads, for want of a better word. So they actually had to juxtapose both side by side in order for their documentary to be taken seriously. Um, for me, as a bridge between the film and the viewing public, critics can't address Indigenous works in a respectful manner unless we are, allow, we are willing to allow for this ontological shift, this, this taking as a truth these Indigenous histories, um, rather than always having to pop, prop them up with um, supposedly legitimate sources. Um, for us to act responsibly in our viewing and reviewing practice, we also have to recognise, as I've learnt myself, um, that we're in a role as a translator between two different and, in some respects, mutually incomprehensible thought systems. Many people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, don't particularly warm to what we might have to say. Uh, while remaining ignorant of Indigenous realities and perspectives is definitely safer, Nobody likes the, me the messenger of challenging news. Um, it's simply not an option, I believe, in, in such a culturally changing world as we currently inhabit. I would also suggest that messengers shouldn't be preemptively or parochially silenced, but instead reminded of the appropriate protocols to be considered and included in their writing. And so that's my next point. 
acknowledgement of and education in Indigenous protocols is essential in any collaborative criticism. Such protocols extend to the medium in question, as well as to the people and the world views or beliefs involved. So at the bare minimum, and I'll talk about this shortly, a collaborative critic must be able to decide when to engage with Indigenous films and when not to. Certain recordings and stories and cinematic materials shouldn't be critiqued, um, or at least not in any kind of mass media dissemin dissemination. Other media must be engaged with under certain um, conditions, and I'm sure that most of you are aware of the protocols around using, using culturally sensitive materials at places like the New Zealand Film Archive and the New Zealand Film Commission. Um, for me, I've asked myself a set of questions. Um, if I'm interested in doing this work, um, is my critique of interest to the indigenous makers of the specific film? If so, then how is my work going to be returned and made available for use by the communities in the future? And also a form of a kind of reflexivity is really important here. Um, being able to cultivate the ability to recognize that you're in this insider outsider status, kind of this idea of kia tupato or being aware or wary of kind of where you are within the community and acting accordingly. Um, such protocols are clearly not the only ones, um, or even the only important ones, but they provided a place for me to begin to th start thinking about this aspect. Um, oh, sorry, I've lost my pace here. Um, assuming the necessary positions or knowledge have been, the necessary permissions and or knowledge have been required, the next step is to think about really how much work such an examination entails. Um, collaborative criticism is immersive rather than being distant or, you know, in investigating the background of the films, the partnerships, the planning, even and especially the problems. And that's what I've tried to really look at in my book is a lot of the problems that came up with this kind of work. Um, textual analysis just can't be the first tool of choice largely because it can't account for any of those factors that I just listed. Um, it's only one of the methods available, and I believe that emphasis should be placed on researching the foundations and the fabric of the work, not simply the surface texture. So, of course, if I was with um, a number of, uh, if I was with other colleagues in my area, this is the point at which I put in the disclaimer. So I'll just go ahead and, and by that I mean working in film studies. Uh, my disclaimer is basically my intention here is not to engage in the debate about the relative pros and cons of the different theories, which is usually what occurs when I present this work. Somebody marches out Foucault and uh, tells me why I should be including him. Um, instead, I would suggest that I'm asking critics and even possibly people here today to recognize the primacy of relationships in the indigenous world and to apply a template based on this way of seeing to ourselves and to the methods and theories that we incline towards. And that's been a really tough one for me over the sort of 10, 15 years I've been doing this work is realizing some theories, uh, you, you might want to use them, but do they perform service? Are they helpful? Or in fact, do they kind of break apart the work that you're actually trying to look at? So I'll try to explain what I mean here by a series of questions. You know, I asked myself, does your method of interacting with the films in question allow you to meet or correspond with the people or the nations, tribes involved? Does it investigate what went into that production? So that means anything from the stories that were used to the cameras that were favored to the props that were made. Does your preferred theory embrace uncertainty, open endings, not knowing things, talking back to the screen, protecting the mana of the people and the, and the stories involved? Does it allow for multiple, multiple viewings? Does it embrace even perhaps culturally consonant change? Is, is it, perhaps this is the most important one, is it flexible and responsive? How many of our academic theories could we say that about? Or does it require wrenching the film to fit a shape that it was never intended to fit? As I've stated before, and for me in particular, 
Collaborative criticism requires moving out of the comfort zone, both methodologically and personally. So at this stage, there's blank screen. Let me practice my technological prowess here. It's not great. Um, there's a blank screen for a reason. If, if you were here in person with me, um, this is the spot at which I would move to my bird's nest. I bring my bird's nest along to talks um, where I, when I give this talk. Um, this is a bird's nest that my husband gave me. Um, he found it and occasionally when I'm in these sorts of sessions and you know there's a lot of technology involved, um, the people are distant from me, um, I like to try to share my bird's nest. Um, if, you were, if you were with me I would, I would take it to you and we would look at it and, and share it together um, because for me it's been a profound way of recognizing, I'm sorry trying to get it in the right camera space here, you can see it right? Yep you can. Um, it's been a profound way of not forgetting that there are many different ways of understanding the world and sitting with what you know. And so right in the middle of the talk, I like to visit the bird's nest um, and just, you know, and sometimes in the, in the course of my work day, I like to visit the bird's nest too, because um, it just, it speaks to me about a different way of knowing that sometimes can be lost even in a forum like this, um, although for what it's worth, these lovely technology uh, service people spent a lot of time trying to get this bird's nest to show you. So, you know, technology and non-technology working hand in hand, I guess, just to sort of um, ask you to consider that, that sort of perhaps a space that is difficult to find in, in a forum like this. Um, so I'll continue, uh, but I'm happy, you know, if you want to discuss that at the end as well, just because I realise we're in, um, keeping an eye on the time too. Um, so engagement. Bateson writes, each person is calibrated by experience, almost like a measuring instrument for difference. So discomfort can be informative and offers a starting point for new understanding. That is, if we're willing to engage with feelings of discomfort, as well as with the text that's producing them. Reciprocity is required, and I would suggest that learning has to go on from both sides, but most specifically from the non-Indigenous side. So, for example, and I've walked through this stage, empathy, even done well, even while done in a considerate manner, means that a non-Indigenous critic or audience member has decided that they are fully capable of inhabiting the world portrayed by the film. The cultural and sociological specificity of what it means to be Indigenous when in fact they cannot. Um, so hasty belonging for me signals the end of communication because it closes down future channels of exchange and understanding. Um, Peter Calder is a national film critic and he argues that if a non-Indigenous reviewer simply avoids any critique in favour of an unquestioning acceptance, and I quote him, they treat the film with an indulgence that would be patronising. It's one thing to label a film difficult to understand from the critic's own cultural viewpoint, something I've done many times myself, and leave it at that so that the judgement stands alone to speak for itself. For me, it's an entirely another, much more challenging task for the critic to label their film difficult to understand from my own viewpoint, demonstrate awareness that this is a culturally specific perspective, and then still go on to do the hard work of justifying why I might have come down on the negative side of the critical fence. For me, cross-cultural interaction occurs when critics not only confront the differences between ourselves and others, but also acknowledge and live with those differences. We might even be able to question our own position and value systems so that the work of watching alters us as both viewers and critics. And for me, such an approach at least begins an examination of specific critical standards, recognizing that they can both illuminate and constrain audience readings. So sorry, this is a bit of a weighty quote, as in there's a lot of it. Um, but collaborative criticism requires the critic to judge the work according to the epistemes of the culture sharing the story, not the culture watching. As far as possible, as far as is possible, given what I just discussed, um, collaborative criticism does important work here, 
First, it provides a gateway for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous viewers and practitioners to enter into respectful conversations about the films and their worldviews. Secondly, when reviewers use collaborative critical principles, this upholds Indigenous filmmakers' sovereignty in a couple of ways. Once in that interaction between the filmmaker and their vision and the critic, and again when audiences read the, that review that the critic has written. One primary way that majority critics can incorporate Indigenous understandings into their critiques is to acknowledge the long lineage behind most Indigenous cinematic themes. So Joanne DeNova um, has quote, is quoted, it is crucial for any Indigenous approach, indeed for any non-racist approach, to account for the antiquity of Aboriginal thought and to assert the antiquity of that intellectualism against more assimilative and dominant forms of inquiry, end quote. So often, and I've seen this many times in the area that I, that I work in, critics misread Indigenous films because they lack and they fail to gain knowledge of Indigenous histories and beliefs before engaging with such films. It's a situation for me that's comparable to an art or film critic who knows nothing about India or Indian ideologies passing judgment on Bollywood. And then to add insult to injury, they use as their yardstick, their limited national worldview and their Western historical framework. Collaborative criticism also allows for not knowing, and this is perhaps the, the biggest kind of, um, the sort of deepest learning that's gone on in, in, for me, um, because it's all about not knowing everything, which as an academic is a very hard thing to talk about and to say, um, and to set yourself up to be um, debated against. Uh, for accepting a cyclical way of looking at the world, for responding to what a lot of Western critics will see as repeats or poor production or silences that shouldn't be there, and for sitting with what the film is trying to share with us, as well as knowing that we may never fully understand or be able to categorize such films. For example, seeing as I'm not of the same culture, I can't in one sitting absorb all the cultural messages embedded in such densely layered work. And actually, I might never be able to understand them all. However, that doesn't mean that I should just stop my exploration at the gate of my own world. Neither is it about resting easy on my own uh, knowledge or cultural laurels. Not knowing is never an excuse for ignorance or simplistic dismissal. Instead, it requires courage and a constant reaching out. Essentially, it also requires, by the same time and simultaneously, tact and graciousness. It, it, need, it needs the ability to know when you've seen enough, when you've done enough research, when you've asked enough questions, when you should listen instead of keeping talking. I'm very chatty, so that's quite difficult for me, no matter what world I'm in. Um, and when you should relinquish the role of omniscient judge, which of course is a critic in the traditional sense is exactly what you're meant to be doing, being the omniscient judge. Perhaps the most radical position of all occurs not even by acknowledging difference and embracing what it has to offer, but by simply accepting that you can never know everything. And to understand that as exactly the means and the end of your critique. So collaborative criticism is also regenerative in the same sense that indigenous productions are regenerative. Critics who value collaborative exchange must stop trying to put things in boxes. I have this vision that comes up whenever I read certain reviews. It's this idea of butterflies being pinned to a board. Criticism shouldn't contribute to indigenous people's ongoing classification uh, sorry, ongoing experience of objectification and cold classification. As one Aboriginal activist suggested, filming is like being speared. Instead, collaborative criticism is proactive in the widest sense. So for me, deconstructionism has little place in this model, nor is this kind of critique fawning or uncritical. Um, instead, as I already discussed, a collaborative critic needs the courage to articulate their position clearly, having done that relational work beforehand, even if they end up settling on an opinion that might not be wholly positive. 
Um, so some of the kinds of work that the, the audience can do with a film, I've listed here just in the interests of time. Um, I do realize that they appear fairly generic and interchangeable with other cinematic categories, but for me, the value of such actions lies in the culpapa. It lies in the place where this action is coming from um, and the kind of ethics or understandings that are attached to such work. Um, so I will explore that next and finish up um, by using an example of the world's largest Indigenous film festival, which I visited in 2013, um, held in Toronto. That's the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival. Uh, where am I? Left? Yeah, okay. Uh, so time to get active. Uh, collabor collaborationist critics need to ask themselves, how has my review or response performed service in relation to the film? Now that doesn't mean it's propaganda, it doesn't mean it's advertising, it's engaging with the film through the methods listed here, even if ultimately the critic's opinion is still that the work has problems or falls short in particular areas. Freya Shiwi, some of you might be familiar with her work, also recognises that such activism can engage with Indigenous media. It can kickstart solidarity politics outside of the academy, and it further explores the possibilities for pushing the decolonisation of knowledge within the academy. Fully acknowledging, comprehending, and taking up the challenge of such connections means accepting what may have been overlooked or underappreciated by mainstream critics and academics until this point. Also, ultimately, however, um, and I kind of wrote myself into this place as I was working on the book, collaborative criticism does contain the seeds of its own undoing as well. It's only ever able to approach a dialogue with Indigenous people's work, and that dialogue is by necessity ongoing and tenuous. It may well be that Indigenous filmmakers and theorists will reject such an approach as still not enough, maybe not culturally located enough or not political enough or just simply too little too late. That said, as a, as a non-Indigenous person, I believe it's unarguable that majority audiences continue to watch Indigenous film um, in a variety of formats, many of which don't really allow them to understand a lot of the cultural context around those films. So here I'm thinking about in the theater, um, on the web. Um, for this reason alone, collaborative criticism, I hope, can speak first to non-Indigenous people so that they can educate themselves to be in relationship with the films that they watch. And um, so my example here from Imaginative, um, sort of just gives you a, a sense of how this can unfold in tandem. Um, collaborative criticism can build on the work done by festivals such as Imaginative by destabilizing non-Indigenous audiences' expectations and assumptions. Imaginative can lay the groundwork for further engagement from the tools of collaborative. So using collaborative critique, Festival goers can assume responsibility for their own watching and maybe therefore watch in a more politically engaged way than they might have before they attended. And further, I hope that collaborative criticism will continue that conversation after the events over, outside of the theatre, into the academy and beyond, reaching out to the world. So in that way, I, I would wish that it would be work that's good to think with. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Davinia. Um, you did well, and sorry for all those technological challenges that you had to deal with. But your, te your techno technicians down there did a great job to keep the birds nest as well. Yeah. Now, at this point, you should be able to flip back so if we don't see PowerPoints anymore and we see you, and it may also mean you'll see us better. I don't know um, if the technician's still there or if they've told you what to do. No, no. Uh, I can see you though. You, you are you're half the screen here. Yeah. Okay. So there's me on half the screen, and then you on the other half of the screen. All right. No, that's all good. Okay. So, um, okay, we'll just open it up to discussion and comment. Oh, here we go. We've got someone who can help me. Could I just make them um, a bigger, bigger screen? Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much.
Yeah. Cool. Thank no you. Worries. I might even know if I, you know, I was going to say I might come down to the end of the table, but I think if I move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, off camera. Good. Yeah. Good. Unfortunately, we're a little bit small and distant at the other end of the table <laughs> from you, but you're perfect for us. Okay. Um, questions and comments? Davinia. Yes. I was interested when you showed the um, Aboriginal film slide early on. Um, the speaker made the statement that an Aboriginal film is a political statement. And then, um, but it seemed to me that one of the things that that speaker didn't say, and I didn't hear you saying, is that any criticism is a political statement. And that that's particularly true with respect to um, Aboriginal, Indigenous films, because they carry an inherent critique of the, the dominant political, uh, cultural um, milieu. Uh, and it's, it, I mean, I, I'm really kind of asking the question, w were you deliberately not using that identification of criticism with um, being, polit being political, or is that just something that um, doesn't fit within the uh, criticism community, film criticism community? Um, no, I think it's it's a sort of sub-theme in my work. Like, I would hope that people would read it running throughout. Right. Um, in, in terms of not giving it a particular subheading, those were really organic kind of subheadings, you know, the principles of the different, you know, um, activism, regeneration, and so on. And, and, and I actually ordered these in a way where if you look at them, you can see a kind of going into being in relationship with the film mm. and, and what you do with that once you come out kind of the other side. Um, so in that way, even the regeneration and the activism for me is inherently sort of political. Mm. Um, and it's, it is a pushback against that kind of criticism, which is very common um, in, in academia, but also mainstream critique, where um, often the, the critic will actually shy away from making any value judgment at all, um, and or will make a value judgment where they didn't like the film because they largely failed to understand it. Mm. Um, and so, it's sort of almost, forgive the pun, turning the lens back on the reviewer themselves mm. and asking them to question why a particular film might make them feel very uncomfortable. Um, because that is often what occurs when I read these critiques. The reviewers were made uncomfortable by the subject matter of the film and therefore ipso facto decided that it was a bad film. Right. When in fact those two things don't necessarily and may in fact not go together at all. That perhaps the level of uncomfortableness is not tied to the production values of the film, but more um, what the film asked of its viewers. And some people feel, don't feel ready to step up to what it's asking them, I yeah. guess. Yeah, it's Barry Barclay's camera on the shore turned on the critic, critic on the critic. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, Barry Barclay and Meritus Meter was really, uh, Meritus Meter's work was really foundational for me in trying to work through these, these principles. Um, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, you know, you said, the only, only crit critic that you've mentioned has been Peter Calder. I wonder if there were critics, you know, actual critics out there whose work you would say um, exemplifies the kind of um, yeah. collaborative criticism that you're proposing? Like, are there people out there who who do this? That's interesting you say that actually, because that could be the next chapter. <laughs> it's not. It's not one that I specifically have thought of until right now. But in fact, that would be a really useful way to kind of carry on what I introduced in the book. Um, I found that there were some people who who 
uh, hedged is the wrong word, but who came close to that idea of even back in the 80s reviewing early um, early Maori filmmaking um, things like Modi um, and Nati I found that there were critics who began that exp exploration and then like for example Pākehā critics were like I'm, I'm made uncomfortable by this film why is that let me think my way through this in my review um, and they start to to make that kind of have that kind of examination, but then at the at the end of the review, and to be honest, I think this is probably um, a space and stylistic more so than the person refusing to continue their their engagement. I think literally just the way the the critique read, it seemed to me that somebody had said it's too long. Um, but they actually, uh, the name escapes me, but it's in one of the chapters that I worked on where um, he was a reviewer and he talked about how as a Pākehā person it made him feel very uncomfortable and he wondered if he wasn't Pākehā, if he was from another uh, community or another um, culture, if he would have the same kind of reaction. Mm. And if put that question out there and then, he's, then he just sort of ended, <laughs> like the review just ends. And so, I mean, and to be fair, it was, you know, the mid 80s when he, when I found this, this review, but that's really this, um, that, that works in my mind. I think it would be very different if I under, if I un undertook an examination now, I think I could, could probably come up with some quite, um, quite a few good examples of people who are trying to do that kind of work. Mm. But that is a real idea, though, actually, <laughs> to, to try to continue and look and see whether um, this is something that other people are trying to engage with. Yeah. What do you want to say about that? Do we need to move that a bit nearer? Yes. I don't know if it makes any difference. Um, um, quite close to Annie Collins, who's an editor who's worked with quite a lot of Indigenous filmmakers, especially Merita Mita. And she says that looking back at Merita's news camera footage, when she was just a camera person on news, she points the camera in different places. Uh, so that she says that Merita had a different eye and a different way of seeing, which is kind of a proto-culture in a way. It's, I mean, it's not, it is cultural, but it's pretty hard to put a finger on it because mm -hmm. it's where you're looking and what you're looking at. And initially when she edited for Merita, she said it was a revelation to see what Merita was seeing in the film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, um, I think it, the cultural difference runs very, very deep to, to as far as a way of seeing and a way of looking. Um, and the values that, that, that um, underlie that are extremely hard to figure out. It's, I found that constantly when I was researching for this book, Films like Two Laws, which is an Aboriginal Australian documentary, mm. um, has a, quite an interesting examination of the fact that the community asked for a, a fisheye lens, which flattens out mm. you know, the filming. Oh, well, I shouldn't say flattens out. It actually rounds, rounds the edges mm. and includes the community so that... They actually... Megan Morris quote, talks about reality streaming in and how different that is from our Western traditional Hollywood models mm. um, and how that asks you to see, literally see in, in a different eye and to value different perspectives and, and people in a different way. Um, also because they considered that camera angles that chopped people's bodies up were just dis was disrespectful and they didn't want that and so that's why they asked for the wide angle um so that everyone could feel included 
in the film. And that's just one example. Um, but there were constant, and, and I see it as well in, when I teach Indigenous cinema, I see this in film, films like Samson and Delilah, um, which is uh, also an Aboriginal Australian film, uh, Thornton. Um, it's a totally different way of viewing the world. And it requires you to sit with that slight uncomfortableness um, and, and it's very interesting watching my students, um, I, I don't want to say progress, but my students walk through the semester. In, in the beginning of the semester, they're like, hey, may I watch this? <laughs> um, and we don't understand it and say why. Um, and, I, and I ask them to talk about why that is. And I ask them to sit with things that make them feel slightly uncomfortable. And the more indigenous films that they watch, they learn to almost a different way. Um, and you can see them taking that walk and they, they feel very differently about the films by the end of the semester. It doesn't necessarily mean that they love them or that they accept them wholeheartedly or that they think that they're perfect. None of those things. Uh, but they are willing to be in more in more of a relationship with those films than they were at the beginning of the semester. Um, I was wondering about, you know, you did, I think, if I understood what you, how you were using Peter Calder correctly, if I understood that correctly, you, you were saying that there is still a place for criticism in this model, right? It's not just... Because um, because none of your points really said anything about being critical of the film, really, in terms of like a negative, you know what I mean? You know, the way we think yeah. critical normally. And I mean, um, and it's kind of, you've talked about the need to know the limits of your knowing, right? Not knowing. And at the same time, you said that you need to be able to judge from within the episteme that inform the story, which sounds like the opposite in a way and probably impossible. Because we're not, as, as a non Indigenous crit critic. Yeah. So, so you've got those things going on. And then, so then, the, and then the sort of idea that, and even so, um, you need to be able to be critical in the kind of classic sense in some way. You know, you need to be able to be not just loving of of the film so um can you give an example or how you yeah, i can absolutely i can give you a couple of examples um i came to that uh i i developed that thinking through my own work with Eritometer's modi which i found an extremely challenging and discomforting film for me um it's one of the films that i worked on my dissertation um with and that was in the late 90s um, where I was in the States although I am a New Zealander um, and I had to get a VHS copy sent over from the New Zealand Film Commission took weeks it was a mission and then it arrived and I'm watching this and I'm thinking to myself literally I'm thinking how am I going to write a dissertation chapter about this film I don't understand it I actually don't even think it's a very good film if you'll forgive me, these are the thoughts that were going through my head. It's taken me 15 years to get comfortable with Modi, um, to feel as though I can be in relationship with that film. Do I f find it an easy watch now? No. Will I ever? Probably not. Do I think that there are some aspects of this film that are technically problematic? Yes. Um, do I think it is a very important film that has things going on that I might not understand or be able to categorize? Yes. It's that uncomfortableness of sitting with, with um, all that contradictory feelings and knowledge mm. and and being able to make that maybe uh, slightly more transparent in the reviews that I write. Um, it's kind of interesting because it sort of suggests, and I think we're going to have to wrap up because I can see our technician waiting to hook up. But I was just thinking one of the things that you're kind of pointing to too is um, 
a willingness on the part of a critic to give up on coherence in a way, to give up on a coming to a singular viewpoint, you know, to be open as well as kind of accepting multiplicity or indifference on the part of filmmakers to be able to be a bit multiple themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and also perhaps uh, when you said give up on the idea of coherence, I would follow that with from a Western model. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Films tend to be extremely coherent within their own worldviews. Um, and, and I might not understand all of those, but I can get a sense of that when I watch them, especially because I, I watch them over and over and over and over because I teach this class mm. you know, constantly. So I've seen a lot of these films 20, sometimes 50 times. Um, yeah, and, and but just very briefly, I know that we're running out of time, but another example is Therese Davis talks about um, Samson and Delilah and how mainstream Australian critics were very keen to grab the film, say it was the first and probably the best Australian film ever made, quote. And in that way, unquestioningly grabbing the film and saying, this is Australian cinema, eliding that indigenous difference completely because they went so far to the other side. And so that was the example that really got me thinking, a, a more contemporary example of a film that you may be familiar with. Um, and that really got me thinking hard about how easy it is to just sweep the film up and mm -hmm. say, oh, look here, you know, a kind of whale rider can be sometimes a whale rider experience. Or more recently, a Taika Waititi experience, which is a film here. And I love Taika Waititi, but, you know, that sort of glomming on to a film and then that's where the critique ends, mm -hmm. instead of asking for different layers within that film or looking at different aspects about it. Just kind of marching along with the National Pride banner is a little scary to me too. Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. a lot of these films are actually dialogic in their open-endedness. Mm -hmm. And given the high value of diversity, I think that most filmmakers would accept there are a number of readings that that are inherent in what they've put forward. Um, and I think that's something we have to culturally come to terms with ourselves because we grew up in the one right answer tradition. <laughs> and Hollywood gives the one right answer too. There's always closure in Hollywood films. They hold your hand and they lead you through. The boy always gets girl so it's very hard for us to step outside of that model if we've been raised in that in that hollywood cinema watching model mm. i think yeah. i think we can probably talk for another hour but we've we're going to have to wrap it up so thank you very much davinia for your talk and thank you everyone for coming and yes. um thank you very much for being for being here <laughs> yeah. and i'm sure you inspired us to go and seek out your book <laughs> no, I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much, all of you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks.